Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Nate the Lighting Guy and welcome to part 2 on repairing the Pioneer CDJ800 Make 2s. As you can remember from the last video, we got these both units cleaned out pretty much their entirety, new surfaces for to replace the dented and scratched up ones, repainted one of the rings on here to replace the rubbed off coating that was previously grimy and disgusting, and painted the surfaces on the uh, bottom plates here to help protect it from rust, give it a nice new shiny look. So what we're going to be doing for these units to finish them up is, is that I need to look into these two knobs right here that I showed in part one to see if I can make those a little more sturdy and resistant as well as get a new knob for this one. We're going to be repairing the mixer unit now and we're going to probably replace a slider because this one previous owner replaced it I believe and it wasn't the exact same slider that was supposed to be used for that. This mixer is probably about as disgusting if not more disgusting than these CDJ units were and I'm going to repaint it. I'm going to paint it the silver color that matches the color of these CDJ units and I'm going to toner transfer to put the labels for the sliders and the knobs and stuff back on. One of the issues that I forgot to mention in the intro that needs to be taken care of is that you can see under channel 2, the phono line input on the left channel has a broken RCA center pin stuck in the jack. So the first thing to do is to, uh, well, take off all the knobs. That one's stuck. <sighs> All right, and now for these ones, that one just came off. And there it is. Sweet. Oh, would you look at that? Well, the outside being dirty, the inside actually looks really good. Take a look at that. Next, we need to get these two ribbon cables out. And I'm just going to pull straight up on those. shell itself on those sharp edges. There's 
for that. You know, actually, I'm just going to put this back on the top here. So I'll just leave that on the top there so that uh, I don't cause any damage to the ribbon cables because they're sticking straight out from underneath. I'm going to need to get something for that. That's easy. These ones are even cut a little bit um, under the sticker as well. There we go. So then that's all the uh, tops of them. So the first mechanism we're going to take off here is that um, this, the two cross, the cross fader and the uh, two slider mechanisms. We're going to pull up this little uh, ripping cable right here because that's connected directly to there. And then we're going to unscrew the uh, two screws on the front right here. And that's what we'll take that off. Oh, there's a okay, hidden screw under the sticker. Take a look. This is what was keeping it from getting out. So I'm gonna. There we go. That should come out now. What the sticker was doing was also blocking the, uh, it's also blocking the uh, selector switch right here, that selects between the different sensitivities on the, uh, on the uh, um, crossfader. All right, let's get the rest of this out. Few screws that are holding it in, that should come out. something. Um, oh, yeah. Another hidden screw. Just found that right here. Okay, now it should come out. Wow, that looks cool. Yes, there's parts in here that do absolutely need to be cleaned. Take a look at the, uh, the, um, was the mic selector here? Also the uh, the um, buttons for the headphones for each channel, and then over here we have the um, beat effects buttons. Yeah, they do need to be cleaned. All right, so I need to be careful and just gently snap them out. And then this one has a. Uh... So this one has a screw that's holding it in. It's also holding down the plastic piece that's uh, on there. So it's a little snap right there. two snaps. Mm. 
and this one right here. And that's out now. And now for this one. And this one has a screw. It's holding in that part there. So then for this one, we also have the uh, this to clean out. And these two buttons here, I'll need to unscrew. <clears throat> or actually, no, they're just snap pieces. Perfect. That one comes out. And that one's out too. Oh, and I forgot one last piece, this slider here. All right, that's all of them. And now it's time to uh, remove the stickers. And so here we go. I'm actually going to be doing some, um, what was it, goof off on this, so the stickers will not be an issue anyway, but the reason why I do need to get the stickers off is so that I can um, scan in all the original painting on it so I know what the labels are, and when I scan that into a photo editing software, I can basically edit out the board so I just have the uh, mask layer I need to have on there when I do the toner transfer. And that's gone and now let's see about the uh, and it left the stick. Lovely. But that won't be much of an issue I just needed to see what was underneath. So when they put this sticker on... At this point I didn't even consider using Goof Off to remove the stickers because I thought it might also remove the paint. But I later realized no. that was not the case. Well actually, this isn't supposed to even be here, so let's see about getting this off. So this tool is a non-scratching scraper tool, so let's see if this does anything. These are some tough stickers. Okay, well there's nothing under there that was important, but just wanted to check just in case.
let's uh, get a start on this sticker. Well, that was much more willing to peel. Yay! Oh, <laughs> well, but it's also taken off uh, <laughs> some of the paint as well. Yeah, oh well. Oh wait. Yeah, I don't know. Sweet. Phones label recovered. Or printing, I should say. Ow. And did that? Oh yeah, it actually took off some of the paint there. Lovely. Oh, look what the look what the sticker was covering up. The uh, not only the switch, but also the uh, switch select options as well. Those would be pretty helpful to see now, don't you think? stickers on the front here to pull off. Right there. I mean, this looks like electrical tape to me, but it's not, actually. Oh! Huh. They covered up the Pioneer logo. I did not know that was there. Gently take off the uh, plastic parts here. There we go. Sweet.
With the stickers removed, all I have to do now is scan the top plate into the computer. So here I have loaded in paint.net. I scanned one half, then I scanned in the other half and merged them together like this. Now that I have the full image here set up and going, I can start tracing over all the uh, printed parts on it, um, like all the white lines, all the numbers and stuff and the background parts of it. So I can prepare that to print it back on after I respray paint it. So what I've been doing is, is that I've been going through and adding the um, text layers to it as well as the um, as well as any of the background and dials and stuff. This may look like it's a lot of work and it is, but here's one way that I found to make it easier is that you'll notice that a lot of the knobs, dials and buttons and stuff have practically the same layout except for these ones that also has like a little um, pointer there on the top. So I could just take this one design, do this once, and then copy, paste, 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 and paste. And then for these ones, just make one of these here, and then copy, paste, 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 and then copy all this, and paste. Um, as for any of the more specialty stuff like the mic on and off switch button, I kind of had to do that manually, and same for each of these two EQ lines. For the text, I basically just traced over the text for the most part. This is still not done yet, I'm working on. But as the same thing goes for with the mic, di uh, the dials for the, uh, yeah. Basically the same thing for all the potentiometers on here. I just copied and pasted the numbers and put them on there where applicable. It's either negative infinity to nine plus or negative infinity to zero. Um, or the specialty ones like high and low there and um, just put them in there like that. So the best way to go about this is to go find where there's repetition and use that to your advantage because that will help you save a lot of time when doing that. The labels that had a little bit of an outline to them, like this microphone one here, you'll see that there's a lot of dots on here. I'll remove the text layer so you can kind of see that. Um, but there's the, uh, the dot layer. This is what was there originally and this is me tracing it over. So what I did to do that was I took the dots here, the little dots here, and I um, basically put a new dot for each one of them and then did it so that there is like one with more dots and then one with less dots and then copy, copy that, paste, 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 and then copy this whole thing, paste, paste, paste. Um, and I might have done one more huge copy and then huge paste all the way to the end here. So there's one way that you can use repetitiveness um, of the design to help make it easier for you to trace out so you can make it look new again. Now this one I had to do an absolute lot of repetition on there. I tried starting off with the dots here. If you zoom in really closely you'll notice that the dots aren't even aligned to the way they are properly. It might be difficult to see that on the camera but let me see if I find a good place. Okay, there we go. So towards the beginning, you can kind of see the dots are off a little bit. And I just did that because the dots on here aren't even following a very specific pattern. Either that or the scanner has... Um, it's either that or the scanner was um, warping it a little bit, which I hope that wasn't the case. But basically, I just did create one of these squares and then copy and paste it over each other to make sure they're exactly the same and then just made it bigger and bigger and then bigger and then soon to soon duplicate it all the way down to like this whole row here and then I just copied and pasted that all the way over to the end there and that is what I did to make that dot background still takes a lot of time but it took a lot less time than just going through and actually doing each of the dots themselves. So, And plus, now that they're in order, if they weren't in order in the first place, they'll be in order now, and I think that'll look good. So that is what I'm doing to edit the front panel. After spending a couple hours, over a couple days trying to trace out all the lines and dials and labels and stuff on the mixer surface. I have finally finished the design and it looks fantastic. 
So what I did next was I made a printout of it. This is one of the printouts that I did. And not adjusting, not adjusting any of the size before, just keeping it exactly the same size as the um, example that I scanned into the computer, I thought I could just print it out and it would line up perfectly. Well, guess what? It didn't. So I had to print it again, adjust and print again, adjust and print again, adjust and print again, adjust and print, adjust and print, adjust and print, until I finally was able to get this right size that it matched up perfectly. I'm a lot happier now that I finally figured out the right dimensions for it because previously, oh, it was kind of frustrating. But after many prints later and many size fittings, testings to make sure it actually lines up, I now have it so that both the top and the bottom part print out for the, for the uh, mixer top lines up. And this is not lined up just because, well, I didn't have it taped down, but something like that. So finally, now that I have that labeled and sized correctly, I can now go ahead and repainting it with the silver surface that I've wanted to paint it so it matches my CDJs, and then reapplying all the labels and stuff via toner transfer. Alrighty, it's been a few days, and now the paint on the cover for the uh, mixer is finally dry. Look at this beauty. I'm really happy with the results about it. So now that this is completely dry, I can go ahead and take the, take the printouts that I copied and scanned in and reverse them to put them on the uh, sticker paper to print them out. And just how we're going to be doing the toner transfer on these is I have these full sheet Avery labels on them. I didn't actually need the labels. What I needed was the uh, sticky background of it. So with one of these full size sticker sheets, I'm going to be printing these, um, printing the covers of these labels onto the sticker side of it, but without the sticker on it. So then that way, when we apply it here, the toner will not stick to the, stick to the uh, sheet, instead it will stick to the background here. So, really looking forward to that, and uh, we'll see how that works. Guess what? It's slit on sides. So, uh, that's really not going to work at all. So, you know what? Scratch that. Got to go find a different kind of a transfer. So I actually found a sticker sheet that was not slit diagonally, lined it up in the light, and I'm now applying the toner transfer. We'll see how this turns out. Alright, well, this is a bit of a mess, but let's see how this turns out. Ooh. This really didn't turn out great at all. As you can see, there's still stuff left out over here. Even though I ironed on this thing several times, it just wasn't coming out. 
Um, I mean, it does look okay, but if you look a little closer at the reflections, you'll see that even though I ironed it, it was just a little too hot, and then it kind of ruined the surface of it a little bit after the spray paint, which is really disappointing. So, I mean, at this point, I'm really not sure what to do. But... Well, I am sad to say that the uh, thing about the toner transfer, the whole idea about making that happen, just simply didn't work. So what I found out was is that the toner, in order to have it melt, which I'm not sure if exactly we needed to reach that temperature, but according to an online form, it was uh, 120 degrees Celsius. And the spray paint that I used to spray this with, the Rust-Oleum, could only stand like about... 46 degrees Celsius, I believe. So, yeah, so I ended up also melting the dried spray paint on here as well, which wasn't good. Um, I re-spray painted, I sanded off where I did the, where I did the toner transfer and then re-spray painted it again. So, back from where we started. I have one more solution this in order to be able to get these labels on it and instead of doing a toner transfer to it I'd like to introduce to you these. These are transparent sheets of paper more like plastic not exactly sure what it's made of but you can print toner onto this and so you have basically a transparent layer of whatever you want to put on there. So all I have to do is put this through the printer and print this on it and then stick this right on top of it, screw it on there, and I have all my labels back. So I'm going to try that next and hopefully that does the trick and if so, we're going to go with that. Then what I'll do is I'll take that and punch out the uh, holes on it too as well so that the potentiometers when they um, screw into the surface here that they can hold down this piece to it as well and that should do the trick and if it doesn't then I'll also cut out the holes and have the screws also hold it in place as well. I've print out the two um, pieces for the uh, front plate on these two plastic transparent sheets and they turned out pretty good. There's a few little uh, there's a few little like missed spots of toner, but it's really not bad at all. It actually looks fantastic. Well, it might have looked fantastic, it was an absolute pain to cut. Later on, I tried using a Dremel tool with a sander bit on it, and that didn't work out as well either. Later on, I decided that this was not going to give me the surface finish that I was looking for, so I decided to seek out a screen printing shop and was able to get my labeling printed on a clear sheet of vinyl with the labeling printed on top of it. We're going to apply that later, but now first some assembly.
I also had the microphone selector's line repainted.
I went to Ace Hardware and picked up unpainted screws to replace all the worn out looking black ones. To replace the incorrect slider knob, I looked around and ordered what I thought was the right one from Amazon, but turned out they sold me a knockoff one that wasn't even the correct size. Instead, I ordered from packparts.com and they were able to get me the correct knob for my model that fit perfectly.
Yay! It's finally done! I've been working on this project sporadically over the course of five months and I am super happy with the end result. It was a long, tiring project with many disappointing moments along the way, but I now have a one-of-a-kind, unofficial Pioneer DJM 400S, adding the S to the end, which stands for silver, in following of Pioneer's DJM naming scheme. It matches my CDJs perfectly, and now I can start practicing DJing without cringing at how disgusting the equipment was. This is part two of the series, so let's finish off the repair for the CDJs. I've looked into a number of options to improve the vinyl speed knob situation, but it turns out Amazon is not the place to purchase replacement parts, because for some listings, you really don't know what you're getting, or if it will arrive without damage, which in this case it did. After calling a Pioneer rep, they told me that Pack Parts was the place to get replacement parts, and I was able to find for certain the exact part to replace it. I also called Pack Parts directly to get some information on how the potentiometer worked. They were willing to answer all my somewhat technical questions, and I was able to get the right parts I needed. Well, that wraps it up for the repair. While well, it was a learning experience, it took a long time, and I'm happy to be done with it. Now to get back to the lighting. Until next time, I'm Nate the Lighting Guy, and thanks for watching.